Okay, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Assalamu Alaikum, peace be upon all of you. So, I posted a video uh, yesterday of a little clip of me teaching, and I'm going to do like a little breakdown of it here. So, I'm hoping that by showing some live video, raw footage of someone teaching in the school is actually somewhat rare. Most teachers are not comfortable with that. It's not comfortable just being filmed raw teaching, and you won't ever see the students in any of these videos. But... I'm hoping that by showing these, it can give some people, you know, just some real world view into things that I'm talking about constantly with teachers and parents about doing with kids, especially the skills of getting them to listen, making them listen to you, the soft skills involved in it um, and showing especially nonverbal skills such as uh, pausing and your facial expression and things like that that have other videos I've talked about. And, you know, giving an illustration of uh, how subtle the, these things are, but how you have to be intentionally, you have to intentionally have them at play all the time. And, I, you know, that's what I'm hoping these breakdown videos to give a view of, is to the, the subtlety of it, but how when you get practiced at it, you use these things intentionally as tools to accomplish what you want to with kids. Now, it ha what's happening in this scenario, I'm reading the book, reading the autobiography of Malcolm X with my 11th grade English class. This is this fall. We're in the beginning of the year here. And we're transitioning from doing the reading to I want them to write something in their notebooks now. So when the kids are transitioning, there's, you know, they got to get stuff out of their backpack sometimes or whatever. They got to make sure they have a writing utensil, like, like the room starts to bustle a little bit because of this. So, you know, there's there's two students who they start taking out, like, some food. from. They're trying to use this as the opportunity to take out whatever snack food they have in their backpack to, to eat it during the time. Now, I discuss it in the video. I don't keep a hard rule against food in my classroom like teachers, like most teachers do. And even, you know, setting the expectations as far as the classroom is concerned and the code of conduct that you need the kids to abide by. No matter what, that's something that you work on enforcing a lot in the beginning of the year and you have to be very intentional with. I don't prefer a style where I just go over a bunch of rules with the kids at the beginning of the year, even though I know what the rules are going to end up being, but I like them to work them out in a natural way to a degree. And in that working it out, it involves discussing the kids and let, allowing the kids to see why that rule needs to be in place. So instead of just telling kids at the beginning of the year there's no food allowed in class and if someone takes food out, no food allowed in class, I let scenarios like the one that plays out here play out. And this is a scenario I've had play out with students more times than I can count. It happens several times every single year. And with the things I say to the students, I know where I'm going with it. So I've labeled in the video like where I'm using some some nonverbals some of the times. So so I'll play it, pause, and go over it. Okay, you gotta write it too, and you gotta answer it. As I've said, an autobiography is a go between, especially this one, as we've seen, descri describing. So with this, there's a few things happening. Now, number one, like some students are shuffling through the papers, their notebooks and this type of thing. And the students who are closer to my phone, which is recording, that's kind of coming in a little bit louder in the recording than it felt in the room at the time. But at the first point where I pause, this is where the, stu the, the two students who are to the right to me. They start going for the food or they've brought it out and it makes some noise. And I pause and you can hear it stop a little bit. While I'm in that pause, another student, it's an, it's an innocent thing, but he starts just tapping his pen, which he's taken out recently, on the leg of the table. And that's not a noise you can have. Now, what I did with that second pause, he actually starts making that noise while I'm in the middle of the pause before that. So I start speaking again after that, but I do it knowing I'm going to pause really quickly and kind of move over, move my face over to, to his side to and to use that second cutoff as a cue to him that he needs to stop that. And this is a whole thing with pausing as well. Sometimes w pausing is something you also use to quiet a classroom down. 
when they're in the when they've come into the classroom when they're doing their talk you need to get them settled down you can begin your teacher talk sometimes but you know you're going to cut yourself off and you're going to struggle to get that first sentence out two or three times but that cutting off that you do kids take that as a cue to quiet down and after the second third time you do it they all get quiet Parents, you can do this as well sometimes. When you need your kids to, to listen to you, you can start talking to them, you know, in a way that they can hear you, but then cutting yourself off will often cue to them that, that they need to listen. And just as a general rule, you don't ever want to try to talk over them when they're making noise. So I'll play that again. You can see it happening in easy way here. Describe... Tapping starts. Describe... Now you can, you can hear there how he paused... He paused the, the, he stopped the tapping right as I did the pause there. It's a go between describing events that happened in the past. And generally, I put quieter voice there. Generally, when you pause and get yourself cut off, you want to do it in a quieter voice. My voice is only a little bit quieter there, but something I did, I, re, I went back to what I was saying the sentence before. So I was, I was cut off in the word describing. But I went back to it's a go-between because that's where I had started the sentence. That's something you want to do when you pause. That, that helps reattune the student's attention to you if they weren't paying attention before. And then the author writing their current day thoughts on it, which you call their reflections, their current day reflections. This autobiography is an unbelievable example of that. So now here, the students, they've gone to... the. the they're going to the wrapper. I think it was some gum and like a sucker that they had. And, and they've gone to it like like even more. And I've cued here both with the face and with the pausing, you know, that I'm noticing it and, and they need to put it away. In many parts of the book, we've seen Malcolm refer in his thoughts on things going now, on now to blacks being brainwashed. Now, that's another cue right there. Like I was going to write something down but paused myself in the middle, kind of looked over at them. What does... So I'm, I've cued to him, and I'm doing it again here. I've cued to him, se th this is cueing to him several times, that I'm definitely aware of what they're doing, and they should take from it that, that they need to stop and, and not go the route, because the food's going to make noise. What does brain... See, now what happens here when I'm paused for an extended time, like like, and I'm looking at them, They'll make like they're going to put it away or they're just leaving it on the table. They're not touching it. Then when I go back into the teaching and looking away, then they go right back to it. So now I, you know, take a little, I do my relaxing breath here, trying to relax my face. And it's, you know, I'm being a little more, the nonverbals that I'm using here are, much, are, are more exaggerated than just the pausing. I mean, it's not an exaggerated nonverbal, but it's something that they can definitely see. It shows more commitment towards towards the issue, and I believe I'm gonna I'm gonna say to them verbally like they need to put it away here. You need to put that away. It's a distraction thing. Okay. Now, now again, very important that when I was redirecting them, because the whole class is watching right now, that I used a quieter voice when I did that, because that doesn't feel like they're being called out then. It feels to them more like I'm saying it to them privately than, than calling them out. So, so the quieter voice was, was is important with that. And again, that I sat back, you know, showed like, well, now I need to take this a little more seriously. That was important. I've told them verbally that they need to put it away, and they're gonna go back to it later. And the issue gets more serious. It has to be directed more. It has to be addressed more seriously when they go back to it. What does brainwashed mean? Okay, good. You'll have an idea of it. You'll have an idea of it. Very good. So you don't need me to explain that to answer it. All right, good. So go ahead and answer. General Blacks, why does he say that they're brainwashed all the time? Why is he saying this? You know, in general, when someone thinks someone else is brainwashed, it's because they see that person has a pattern of thinking that is maybe... Okay, right here at this pause, you can kind of hear the crinkle. Like they're starting to go back to it. Be not good for them, or at least the person calling them that thinks it's their pattern of thinking is not good for them. So they're thinking something or valuing something 
that is against their own good. So why would someone think that way if it's against their own good? Well, okay, you can you know, hear. I, like, you should be able to hear, but you can hear the crinkling of the wrapper, and pretty soon the student is gonna just go full on. Because when they try to rip that wrapper open, it, it really makes some noise, and you can't avoid it. And the student is trying to do it quietly, like bit by bit. But you get to a point where you gotta make like a, a real tear in it, and it can't help but be noisy. They've been their mind's been corrupted. Here. This is kind of this way of saying. Now here, why I put the pen down, I labeled that because, again, it's time to address the issue here. And when you have to address something, you have to show commitment to the problem with your body language to the student or to the child. So, like, a mistake some parents make is trying to deal with their kids like if, you know, you're in the kitchen watch it, washing dishes, the kids in the living room, and you're just yelling at them to the side or this type of thing, or, you know, or you're reading your book or you're on your phone and you're just trying to redirect them by, by talking to them to the side or whatever. Kids don't, they, they won't take that seriously because you're not cueing to them that that's serious. You have to put down whatever you're doing. If, you know, if you need to get closer to them, you have to approach them slowly. When you talk to them a lot of the times, if you're standing up, it's important to have your toes pointing towards them to show full commitment. So here I put the pen down, which shows like, you know, because the pen is part of my instruction at this point because I'm showing them something they need to write under the document camera and my, my notebook is on the screen there. So it shows that I'm, I'm and my, my instruction is completely cut off. You can see I'm relaxing my face here, which, you know, even with the mask on, even with the mask on, you can see it. And I, I'm not sure, I'm maybe being a little more exaggerated with my eyes because of that, because of the mask. But I have, I have other videos about the importance of not showing tension in your face. And I do get tense a little bit here. And you're always a little more tense when you're talking to a group of people or a group of kids versus one-on-one. -on -one. I do get a little tense later because I am irritated. I do get irritated. And managing your irritation, that is part of the moment-to-moment -moment day day-to-day work with kids. But the, but the point here is that putting the pen down, turning towards them, it's showing full commitments to the problem. And I told them once already to put it away. So now I have to get even more specific with what I want them to do or not, or, what, or in this case, what I don't want them to do. Because based on what I'm seeing, I can anticipate what they're going to do. And one of them has a package of like Trident gum that I think she just opened. The other one has like a sucker. You need to... Uh, both of you don't you open another still package of anything. So, so I stayed gum, paused there. You open the general package. Moving. It has a little package for each individual piece of gum. Don't open those. The sucker, don't open it. Okay, as I've explained before. In now, it's important when you're talking to kids that it's, you know, sometimes you have to tell them not to do something and to do something else. But it's important to explain reasoning to them and there's foundational reasons for that now what i'm about to explain here this is something that i've explained to them before this issue actually came up on the first day of school and this is the way i, I articulate the rules to of eating towards them so it's not just you can't eat and that's it and if you if you say something if you pull something out you get in trouble or i tell you not to do that but it's attached to reasonings both in terms of the functional reasoning of the classroom and then bigger life reasoning as well. Principle, I don't have anything against food in the class, but like anything else, it's not a problem unless it's a problem. And it's very hard for it not to be a problem because what you come in with is junk food. Junk food is meant to make as much money as possible. So I still pause there. And the, 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 the thump there, I'm pretty sure that was a, another student like putting a book down hard or something like that. But one way or the other, you know, even though this message is meant for two direct, two students directly, you know, when you have a group, to avoid calling the students out too much, you want to kind of deliver the lesson as a general lesson. So you also want to make sure that everyone is listening when you're doing that talk. Bye. Can you not do it, please? Okay, now something that happened there, when you do this pausing, what it does, part of why it's effective, because it cuts the class off, 
Now, there's plenty of students, I'd say most students, who they want to learn and they want the class to keep going, especially if you're learning or reading something interesting. And they respect you. So part of what happens with this pausing is the students who are creating the distraction, they begin to sense social pressure from the rest of the class. And that is something that they respond to. It might be kids, a lot of times, it's usually in the form of kids looking at them with disgusted looks. Like, why don't you stop? And the kids know, the other kids know that I was pausing before because of them. So it's like, why don't you stop? Now, sometimes kids uh, who are irritated enough with that In this situation where you're redirecting things, they will say to the other kids, like, shut up or, you know, stop talking. You know, they'll try to do the direction themselves because they're getting a little impatient with it. This student said this student said to them, like, bring an apple. Now, like, it's good and it's good that those students are applying that pressure to to the uh, to the students who are creating the distraction. But at the same time, it's a balance you need to strike as a teacher, because ultimately, the kids who are creating the distraction, number one, they don't want to hear it from other kids. So, and number two, they would like to distra- they would like for there to be a distraction from whatever is going on. So it's very common that when kids do that, when they try to help you out as the teacher by redirecting or admonishing themselves, the kid who's created the distraction, the kid who has created the distraction will snap back with them and be like, shut up, who are you? Don't tell me what to do or something like this, you know? So that's why I paused and quietly said to that other student, can, can you not do that? Because cause even though even though that student is trying to help me and has a good point about bringing the apple and I'm about to bring something like that up, ultimately it's not going to be helpful for that, for that student to do that, even though they're well-meaning when they do. Jump. Junk food is a whole industry. It's a whole money-making industry. So they try to produce as cheap a food as possible that has either a ton of sugar or a ton of sodium to get people really addicted to it so they keep going back to it. Part of the cheapness of it is they use the cheapest plastic possible to package it in. So that is why when you just touch chips or the wrapper on this thing, it's a very noisy plastic. So you can't really... Okay, now this is a really important line of reasoning to give to the kids. And, you know, making the connection between macro-level things in the world and and the micro-level things going on right there between us in the classroom, I, I find is very powerful with kids. And it's powerful in parenting as well. Now, something about kids, they, and teenagers especially, they buy into things when you explain to them that someone is sort of trying to manipulate them when you connect a reason of why they should not do something to that this was found statistically in studies of anti-tobacco smoking campaigns in the united states so in the 80s and 90s the united states government and in public service announcements they had all kinds of commercial campaigns trying to warn kids of the dangers and health hazards of smoking because teenage smoking really started to become a problem in the 1970s. Campaigns against it started in the 80s, and it really, really peaked in the 90s. Now, through the 80s and 90s, when all those anti-smoking campaigns were going on that were all focused on anti-health messaging, it didn't do anything to stop teenage smoking. It only increased. Teenagers weren't responsive to that anti-health message at all. Now, after the turn of the century, though, the public service announcements, they started taking a different angle where they started turning the campaign against smoking on the corporate executives of the tobacco industry themselves. And they started showing them giving witness testimony in front of the United States Congress where they were claiming that they didn't think there were health problems with it. And they would show those and then like show an image like, do they think we're stupid or something? So once the public service announcements started switching the angle of their campaign to teenagers away from uh, health hazards, because teenagers, I- I've talked in other videos before, they downplay risk in their decision making. They-, they downplay risk. So a lot of times the the health hazard argument, they can understand it and, and they might know that it's correct, but they will re- they will rationalize away from that. Because that's not so immediate to them. 
And they are healthy. They're very healthy at their ages, and they get over things well, and they can see themselves having a long life ahead. So, so they'll rationalize those things away. But when the angle is there's some greedy adults who are trying to manipulate you with this thing, and teenagers are under manipulation all the time. It's a, it's a reality by every industry out there. Every industry is trying to attack their minds, their psychology, and their bodies to make money. And it's a legitimate thing to point that out to them. So so connecting that to something going on in the classroom like this and the thing with the junk, junk food, it tends to be something that they buy into. So you can't really touch it without it making noise. If you want a snack in class. So here, again, like, you know, you can't just tell students what not to do. And this goes back to why it's better, you know, especially at 11th graders, okay, 16, 17-year-olds. A lot of them are working jobs now for the first time, especially this year, because places are hiring anybody. And uh, young people, they can't collect the unemployment check. So a lot of them got jobs for the first time in the summer. You know, they desperately want independence. Like, it's a really frustrating thing for kids at this age. Like, they really want independence. So they don't like feeling like you're just putting rules on them for the sake of, uh, of rules being there. So that's why I don't have a problem with letting these things play out in my classrooms and having the opportunity to point out the reasoning for them. So that's why I don't make a hard rule against food, but I try to show them if you're going to take if you're going to if you're going to take advantage of the privilege of having food, there's a responsibility that comes with it and it's got to be done in a responsible way. So that's where the talk here gets into. Bring an apple in. Bring a banana. Ban Can you not interrupt, please? Okay, now a really important thing going here on, and this is the student who was trying to open the gum anyway, who says, who eats an apple? All right, now, you know, teenagers are, uh, they're hilarious. Like, yeah, who eats an apple? You know, it's, I mean, it's not like it's the most commonly eaten fruit in uh, North America, and there's not huge shelves of it in any grocery store. You go, I mean, who eats an, I mean, who asks a, who asks the question, who eats the apple? Uh, who eats an apple? A teenager is who asked that question. Now, the thing is, too, as an adult teaching these kids, like when she asks that, there's definitely a part of me that kind of wants to go sarcastic with her, or, and, you know, and kind of wants to point out how, you know, ridiculous a question that is, actually. But, you know, I'm asked a lot about how to not argue with kids. And the way you don't argue with them is you don't argue with them. Now, especially in this situation, and, you know, she, she's not in trouble or anything, but she's somewhat on the spot here. And, and I've, I've broken class. I've broken the class instruction to address this issue. A, a young person in that situation, they would love more than anything to sidetrack the discussion. And this is a lot of times what kids are trying to do with their talk back. So instead of it being about the, you know, the regulations and the expectations of eating in the classroom, let's make it about, you know, who eats an apple because that, that came up or whatever. So if I were to respond to that, then I'd end up with this back and forth between her. And, you know, if I started saying, you know, if I started addressing that, how ridiculous it is to ask that question or whatever, the whole thing could go down a whole different line. But that's not the point. So when, when you're trying to enforce rules and expectations upon kids and get them to buy into it, you have to keep the focus on what that is. And you can't engage in the arguing with them. Now, I said to her, can you not interrupt? I maybe didn't even have to do that. I probably could have just paused and, and rested on my relaxed face as I'm doing here. I could have done that. You know, there I had the feeling as if this was like the fourth or fifth interruption I've gotten from her, even though it was only the first verbal interruption, but be, but because of the stuff going on with the packaging, I felt like it was the fourth or fifth one. And when getting interrupted by kids, th that's kind of how it goes. Okay, you, you give the nonverbal cues several chances to take hold. If, the, if it doesn't, okay, then you get to a place where you address it correctly, how, how directly. However, you don't want to address it by slamming your foot down or slamming your hand down and yelling. You, even when addressing it, you want to remind yourself to be relaxed as possible. And me, I do do that here, and I'm more relaxed here than a lot of people would be because I try to stay in that mode. However, even when I rewatch this, I can tell the irritability was getting to me to a degree. And if I look at my forehead here, it's a little more wrinkled than it was earlier when I was given more relaxed talk. So the, the, the irritation is getting to me a little bit. 
but but because I try to stay relaxed overall, it's it's not too bad. And and uh, and the important thing I'm going to do here is again re- is make sure the frame of the discussion comes back to the point and, and it doesn't sidetrack. Because this is what you do when a kid tries to argue with you or tries to sidetrack you from what what's whatever is going on. Thank you. You are wanting to eat in class. I'm trying to explain to you how if you want that, how that can be done and our learning environment cannot become corrupted from it. Bring an apple into class. Now, I put nice voice there just because I did sense during the time that I was becoming a little more tense. So I tried to speak in a little nicer tone. But again, here's, you know, here's getting into if you want to eat in class, if you want to eat in class, you want to do this thing, here's how you can do it in a way that works. And it involves more responsibility. It involves more planning, which is, of course, something that teenagers need help with. And part of the lesson that they need to learn here is that, you know, if you want things a certain way, you have to plan for it and be prepared properly and all that type of stuff. Bring a banana into class. Orange, maybe, though your hands will get all sticky and that will become a whole thing. And it'd be better for you as well. Be healthier. Bring some broccoli crowns and a piece of Tupperware. Very good for you. Very nutritious. Okay. Now, I wanted to get into the vegetable talk here intentionally. Like, right before I mentioned bringing broccoli crowns, I could have just gone back into the lesson. Maybe I should have. But, I again, I didn't mind going into this side lesson with the students. And, you know, this is actually one of the beauties of teaching. There, you know, it's not just about what you teach. But you're with kids constantly. And I mean, this is just a little five minutes within one 63 minute class. These things come up all the time. So I knew by suggesting the vegetables, I knew they're going to kind of give this reaction like, oh, no, broccoli. And I mean, it's so hilarious. Uh, you know, kids aren't, you know, one of the things I'm most thankful for in teaching is that I taught elementary school before teaching high school. Because once you teach elementary school, you get these things down. It's only easier with high schoolers. But it's, you know, there is there's differences between them. But it's also funny how similar the kids can be from within those ages. Because these kids hated eating vegetables when they were five. Even though they watched PBS Kids and they watched Sesame Street and all, all that, they learned that cookies, candy, and chips are sometimes food and vegetables are an anytime food. But amazingly, even in high school, 16, 17 years old, they still need the messaging that vegetables are important. And we need to have people around them and in the schools with them who are going to give them the messaging that they need. So it's a very worth, worthwhile endeavor to do. Okay, and most of you, I know are simply not getting enough vegetables in your diet. And then you're wondering why you're depressed. You're wondering why you're anxious. You're wondering why you get angry easily or this type of thing. Okay, and here I may be, I may be being a little mean here and I may be a little irritable because, you know, and at this point actually they start taking the lesson kind of seriously and I, and I could see it on their faces, which is good because, you know, you have to take, you have to bring kids into serious lessons. And there is a degree to which you have to provide some admonition to them from time to time. And I, that's something I talk about with them in the beginning of the year. That's part of why I read the autobiography of Malcolm X with this class, because he talks about remembering his mother in a fondly way because she admonished him in chapter one. And sometimes you set those things up in a classroom. But, you know, here, like, OK, I don't need to be like this. You know, I, I, I could have said this in a nicer way. Other than saying, oh, you wonder why this. Okay, it's a little shaming in, in the way I'm talking. And, and that's, a, that's a little bit the byproduct of the irritation that I'm feeling. But I still give the message that I want. And, and I'm going to get to the next point, which is important, which is reminding them that they're growing. Because I have other videos that uh, where, where I've mentioned. Well, we'll let it play. And then you have a diet with no vegetables. That's something that you need to rectify with yourself a little bit. You need to take some individual action to take care of. Now, this student right here, who, who was not involved in the whole thing, but, but this is one of the fruits of this type of teaching and, and being able to get into these everyday things with kids. Because this, this student is asking for clarification, like, wait a minute, wait a minute, like not eating vegetables can cause you to be depressed? Because this is a real world concern for that student. And I know for several students it is. And, you know, this is a chance for them to actually learn about it. 
And, you know, of course, depression and anxiety, these are concerns with teenagers. And mood disorders are most common amongst teenagers than any other age group, especially adolescent females. That's most common. So there's an, I don't want to say there's an extent to which it's developmentally normal. I'd say it's developmentally predictable with kids, with kids this age, that they're going through that. And this is why so many kids are their age it will say, you know, we need to look out for mental health, talk about mental health. And they're getting a lot of that messaging on uh, social media. But also a lot of the messaging they're getting on social media and especially TikTok is another thing trying to manipulate them because it's trying to get it's trying to feed in to the emotional downward spiral that you can get into when you're depressed by, you know, over validating it maybe to a degree or trying to trap too many kids into thinking they're going through something abnormal when they're going through something normal. There is a lot of this on TikTok, especially Instagram has a lot of it as well. You know, people talking about like, oh, if you, you know, if you procrastinate, it means you're, you're, you're depressed or you have ADHD or something when procrastinating is totally normal. There's a lot of this stuff on TikTok, especially because if you Google search what age group watches TikTok, it tells you ages 18 to 24, like 16 to 24. So there's a lot of people on there who understand the psychology of those ages very well and understand the type of messaging, messaging that's going to rope people in to feeling a sense of validation from watching their channel. So some of this, you know, and, and it's not all bad. Like some of it's good mental health. There's plenty of good mental health advice, of course, too. But some of it is, some of it is trying to, some of it has, has the effect of entrapping kids into thinking they have a problem they may, maybe don't. There's also a lot of things on TikTok as well that are pitting kids against their parents and 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 trying to um, bring an angle to them that their problems are the, the fault of over-controlling parents and this type of thing. Because if you understand the psychology of this age group, they're at an age where criticism against their parents can become very, very sharp. And, and sometimes there's some reason behind that, but there's also not a full picture from their view because they're still very self-centered to a certain degree, especially relative to adults. What is not messaged to them enough in these platforms is what they can do within their own self-control to try to make things better for themselves. That is definitely not messaged to them enough because whatever messaging they get, it is usually something conducive to just wanting them to scroll, 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 scroll on those things. And when it comes to mental health and depression and anxiety, you know, there, there's all kinds of things playing into it. And it can be a different type of issue for different people. Sometimes it is very much a, a mental health issue that needs to be addressed. But however, like you can't ignore the things that need to be in place to make sure the person is doing regarding their own action to control against it. And those certainly begin with diet, sleep, and exercise. Because a poor diet, not getting exercise, and not getting enough sleep what will lead to those things. And, and and to me, and I'm not I'm not a mental health professional. And this is not medical advice, but but to me, it's smart to control against those things. Certainly before you go putting someone on pills or, or this type of thing, or assuming that it's a chemical imbalance, especially. And I have a previous video that I made on my YouTube channel. You can look earlier um, about the question of whether or not depression is even caused by uh, chemical imbalance, which a lot of people assume. But but you need people need to look deeper into the research on that. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. Not having a, having a diet with like virtually no vegetables, a diet that's high in oils, a diet that is high in empty carbohydrates. Having having a diet devoid of um, vegetables will absolutely contribute to hypertension, which it, when you're older that causes blood pressure problems, and that hypertension will make you anxious irritable and the counter side to being anxious and irritable is being depressed as well okay now a few things on here on here first of all like they're they're getting very quiet they're they're listening to this very very seriously and it's a good lesson given to them i remember i can see at this point though that they have some like down look on their face and i've talked before like something you have to be conscious of with teenagers especially you have to always remind them that they're growing, which I'm gonna, which I'm gonna do here. They need that reminder a lot because they, they take, they will take things very harshly, or, or, or you know, they'll internalize it against themselves. 
very much so, so and start feeling like they're a loser or start feeling like, you know, they're no good. Because for a lot of them, hearing this, that there is an importance with their mental health regarding their diet, that might feel a lot hard for them a lot, okay? They, they do have the, the, the ability, and they're going to have to think about it, but they might not be able to make the connection fully right at that moment of how they can start getting more vegetables in their diet and how they cannot. So they might not feel like it's something that they're capable of doing, this type of thing, and that can cause them to feel down. You know, now you have to give kids some doses of that because it's reality. And some of that, which, you know, you might call guilt. And there's some people who are the, of, the, of the opinion you should never make kids feel guilty. I don't agree with that at all. But, you know, you want it, but you want it to be moderated and planned or you want it to be moderated and balanced. But, you know, but, but, I, but doses of it ca cause reflection. And it's not so bad when it's delivered in a general way like this, as opposed to being, uh, you know, individualized towards someone like there's something wrong with you. So it's a chance for them to reflect. Now, now the one young man here who's a very nice guy. He's at he's whenever I give this talk, there's always a kid who wants me to say that fruits will do the same thing as ve as vegetables. So that's why he's asking about apples because they just don't want to believe that they have, they have to eat vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> to have a good good diet but 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 i kind of i kind of um ignore what he was saying and i go into the correcting uh or, or the reminder that they're developing i go into the reminder of that to, to to moderate maybe some of the guilt that i'm giving here i was talking about broccoli when vegetables came up okay. and look i'm not trying to make anyone feel bad for not eating vegetables this is advice this is advice you're young you have the ability to take control of your eating habits in life. Those are all still developing. Inshallah, in the future, you'll have more control over it than you do now. And notice I got, um, you know, quieter with the voice and giving the reminder. And, th and then it ended like that, and we're able to go back in the class. So, you know, after that, the next time a kid has some food or something, they're really going to think about doing it, and the expectations are set for, for how that needs to be done. So anyway, I hope it, this didn't go on too long. The thing I really hope you see, and I'm sure I can come up with some other examples because I have other footage. You know, pausing is something I've talked to people a lot about. Like, like this pausing is a nonverbal cue that you really need. Because if you're, if you're overly reactive or, or like, you know, like when the rappers are first starting coming out or the kid was tapping the pencil or whatever, you know, if I, if I kept going to stop doing that, stop doing that, stop doing that. You know, that, that, that would agitate the kids. And when you agitate them from your own agitation, the kids start to resent it. And then there will be some kids who start doing the things that agitate you for the intention of agitating you and to see how far they can agitate you and, and all this type of thing. But, you know, the, this pausing, the relaxed face, even taking the time to explain out the reasoning in macro and micro ways for why as a teacher or the adult or the parent or whoever that I want things to be the way they are, this all signals to the kids that you have patience with them. They have patience with them. And that creates a comfort zone between you and them. Inshallah, bidnilah.